1916 Rising was an event that led to the formation, eventually, of an Irish Republic. And the events of that historic week changed the course of history for Irish men and women right across the nation, including here in County Monaghan. Most of the Rising events took place in Dublin City, and reactions to it across the country, including Monaghan, were initially mixed until such time as the Rising became a nationwide concern. There were a number of Monaghan people and those connected with Monaghan who took active part in the Rising, and others who were witness to it. It's only now that many of their stories are being told in detail for the first time, by historians and by relatives. One hundred years after the events of the 1916 Rising, these Monaghan connections are being told in a major exhibition at Monaghan County Museum and by commemoration groups across the county, telling this history of rising participants and eyewitnesses with stories of passion, sacrifice, chance, tragedy and patriotism. For these people of Monaghan connections, some just happened to be there at this seminal event, but others, often people from humble backgrounds, were there by choice, fighting for the freedom of their home, their county, their country. In Monaghan Museum, curator Liam Bradley is telling me about their exhibition From a Whisper to a Roar, and giving me a view on how the rising was perceived in Monaghan. What is it that you found in, in putting this together, that the feeling of the rising at that time? What did it mean to the people of Monaghan? Uh, I think it was multifaceted. I mean, you had to look at it from different points of view, depending on what background, depending on what community you came from. But for the people of Monaghan in general, it really was initially something that happened down there they weren't too sure about. But as the months went by, the changes started to happen. I think in particular, as the connection with James Conley and Monaghan started to become a lot more obvious, and obviously how James was um, executed. I think all of that happened to bring it very much home to modern people that, you know, although we didn't know who these people were really, although we weren't too sure exactly what they were fighting for, maybe we didn't agree with it. As time goes by now, we actually do admire them as patriots. We see them as heroes. And within a very short period of time, the vast majority of modern was either directly or indirectly involved with pushing for, for the Republic. So it was a huge, huge, huge effect on the county. Some of the people that we're learning about now, we didn't actually know a lot about before, but sure. uh, through your own research and with uh, Terry Dooley as well, um, we've been able to tell the story of some of these people in a lot more detail than that sure. was ever known. Absolutely. Well, I mean, if you look at people like, for instance, Sorka McMahon, I think that's one in particular that I'd be very interested in. Sorka was one of the founder members of Common Law. She was in the Common Law Council. She was in GPO the entire week. She ran messages mostly in between Tom Clark and Kathleen Clark and, and various other people as well. She also mobilised an awful lot, set around a lot of mobilising orders, active the entire week. After that she set up the Independent Dependence Fund which raised money for any of the dependents from the, the people who were executed. And then she went on to be uh, essentially a spy, a close confidant and secretary with uh, Michael Collins up until his death. An incredible story and this is a Monaghan moment. So that's one person we're very interested in. Her brother's another very interesting story, Pather. He was one of the founder members. He joined up the volunteers the first night they set up in 1913. He was active all the way through the Rising. He was working. He was under Michael Mallon in the St Stephen's Green, and then obviously they retreated to the College of Surgeons, and he spent the entire week there. He went on to become chief of staff of the Irish Army, and then a minister as well, and all the way up to his retirement. Again, a hugely influential figure in Irish politics. And these stories, although they're aware, people are aware of them. Maybe they don't. I think that they really realise the huge importance and how Mallon very much is a big part of that story of the Rising. So even though this is 100 years later, we're actually only learning about some of these people for the first time. Exactly. And I think that's a great opportunity of this period now. I mean, obviously it's a huge national reflection on what the rising means and what in the context of that now, 100 years on. But what we can do here in a regional setting is choose those specific people and really highlight what they did. And not just because of why they did it, but because they deserve it. These are people who genuinely had the courage to put their money where their mouth was, to stood up put their body on the line and decided, I believe in this, this is what I want to do. And you have to admire that, and those people definitely deserve that recognition.
Part of this exhibition tells the story of three siblings from County Monaghan who participated fully in the Rising. I met with Father Hugh McMahon at the Irish Missionary Union, and he's written a book about these three siblings as he's very closely related to them. So Hugh, your book, A Fist to the Black-Blooded, the McMahons, of course, and you're telling the story here of your father, your uncle and your aunt, all very prominent in the story of the Rising here uh, in Dublin. We're looking at the original farm and mills, picture here of Sorka, uh, your aunt with Brian, your father, and your grandfather, James Ardle. And then on the next page here, your uncle Pather, who went on to have a very prominent role, not alone in the Rising, but afterwards a hugely significant military role. Yes. Ended up as a Lieutenant General and Chief of Staff. And here he is, leading troops on parade in O'Connell Street, Street, on horseback. That's right. Your own family had three members of which were taking part in the Rising. Your father, Brian, your uncle, Pather, and your aunt, Sorka. So uh, a hugely influential Monaghan family taking part in the Rising. Yeah, it's an amazing story, but it's interesting. Up till about five years ago, I, I knew hardly anything about her because, like a lot of people in that generation, they didn't talk about her. And I knew that my uncle has kind of was in, involved in 1916, and then he was a high role in the Ar- Irish Army afterwards. And my aunt was in Come on the Morning, she was in the GPO in 1916. And my father, I knew, well, he'd been blown up in Dundalk Barracks, but no one talked about those things. And I knew all those people when I was young because they were all living in Dublin and uh, they would come visiting and that and I would, but I couldn't get anything out of them. You know, I tried to say, what happened and that, but they didn't, they didn't want to talk about it for various reasons and maybe they come out in the book. I tried to explore the reasons why they didn't. And it was only about, um, say, 10 years ago when they began to open up the files and uh, they found that they had, they had written histories. In the case of my father was, uh, Father uh, Larry Marin in, in Monaghan way back about 40 years ago he he knew a lot of these people who were involved in, in, in the IRA in, in, and the, in 1916 so he asked them to write out their personal histories and said they wouldn't be uh, made public for 30 years so they were hidden away so it was only by chance I heard that my father's account of over 30 pages was in the Monaghan Museum and I went down there and they were very helpful and I, we dug them out and I had to transcribe them too. But uh, up till then I had nothing on him. And they were very interesting because they were so detailed. It's the same then I got my uncle's military history and my aunt's kind of pension. And my aunt was a great friend of Kathleen Clark, you know, whose husband was really the, the man who, who ran 1916. And uh, so in Kathleen's uh, book, she, she wrote a lot about her greatest friend, Sorica McMahon. And so I got a lot of uh, stuff from there and other sources. So it was only by exploring it, but for the last five years, that gradually this picture emerged and some very fascinating stories came out of it. I'm interested to know about your Aunt Sorka yes. and particularly the, her involvement in the Rising. I mean, she was stationed at the GPO. Yeah, well, the, uh, there were seven in the family up in, in Monaghan, but three of them went up to Dublin. And she was the first to go up to, uh, to do it. She graduated from the Louis Convent and then did a commercial course. And she was working in an office in Dublin, in a garage, actually, in Dublin. And as soon as she got up there, I think like a lot of other people, she got involved with the Gaelic League. And I was think there she, she met Kathleen Clark, who was um, Tom Clark's wife. And they became fast friends. And when the Come On The Mon started, both of them joined up. And shortly afterwards, uh, Sorica became the secretary, the general secretary of it. So she knew Tom Clark, and because she would be visiting his office nearly every day, uh, she would have known all the leaders of the, uh, the Rising that time. And uh, when uh, she was one of the few people who were, knew that it was going to go through, that it wasn't going to be cancelled. So she, her job was to mobilise all the common uh, ladies and uh, make sure they went to their proper places and her job was really to go in and out and uh, to the GPO and she must have, I don't know many times she went in and out. Uh, Kathleen Clark was, had to be stay at home she, she was she was having maybe one of her, her first child at the time no. and 
she couldn't, she didn't, she wasn't supposed to go to the GPO anyway. So she was carrying messages from Kathleen Clark into Tom Clark and back out again. And uh, it's all in Kathleen uh, Clark's book about what she did. So uh, she all, yeah, so she had a lot of job bringing messages to the other people around the, around the city. So, um, so she was travelling around on her bicycle. She was taking bicycle. dispatches or messages yeah. around to, to various people and then coming back again. Back to the, to the, and yeah. I, I believe also uh, bringing ammunition and uh, fresh clothes. Yeah. Yeah, so she had a very busy, t- busy few days on it. And a very dangerous occupation to be at. Yeah, and she, if you see the list of places she, she went from, over Fibsborough and uh, downtown and across, and they realised she did it all by bicycle. And she had the stuff in her basket and on the front of it. Sometimes she was bringing in ammunition or uh, materials into the GPO or around, and around the city. So that's how she was travelling around. Now, your uncle Pather uh, had a huge involvement in the Rising as well, stationed at St Stephen's Green, but tell me his story. He came up after her to Dublin, so uh, about two years later, when the, uh, they were in the same house when the 1911 census was taken, so I found them, their names there. And he was working also in an office, but he got involved with the local volunteers. And um, so when it came to 1916, he was called out. And uh, they got as far as Stevens Green, and he was sent back then to Fibsborough to collect arms, uh, he was supposed to go to Jacobs with the rest of his company, but uh, when he went there, when he came back with the arms from Fibsborough, uh, they stopped him in Stevens Green. Uh, Malin was there and Captain Markovit, and they said, uh, "You're needed here." They were Citizen Army, and he was the volunteers, but they had orders to stay wherever an, of- an officer told them. So he was cut off from his own group in in, in Jacobs, but he stayed on in in Stevens Green, and he was there. Uh, he was promoted there to lieutenant. He was a section leader up till then. So when they moved from um, Stevens Green into the College of Sergeants, he moved in there with them, and he was there for the surrender. When the surrender came, then he said he wanted to go off and join his own group who were up in the Jacobs. So he took the message there up to Jacobs uh, from Malin up to, to Jacobs to the message of surrender. So there he was with his own company up there when the surrender came. And uh, after that, they were marched off and down the quays and off to to Wales, where he was in jail over there, and then with the rest of the people for for the next uh, seven or eight months till Christmas. After the rising, Pather went on to have a very illustrious career, a military career. In some of the photographs that you have of your uncle, he's. Uh, leading troops, uh, he's on horseback, uh, looking very fine and dashing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like he was in charge of the Curragh camp, and, which was the training place for the, the, so, the soldiers. And then as um, he was chief of staff, so he was based in the, in the house there in uh, Phoenix Park. So there's photographs of him leading, leaving Phoenix Park on his horse with the, with the troops. So he was a lieutenant general at, at that time, which was the highest rank in the Irish army that you could achieve. Your father uh, was involved um, slightly in the rising. He certainly was there at the time, Uh, but illness overcame him. Tell me of his involvement or not in the rising. Yeah, well, he was the last to come up. He only came up probably in 1915 because he was only about 17 or 18 years old. He came up to UCD to study law. Uh, But he immediately signed up and he was kind of at the level of probably a corporal at at the time. But just a week before the rising, going around uh, visiting his men, he got um, scarlet fever and was in the uh, fever hospital there near the forecourt when the rising there because he, he says he was inside and he could hear the bullets flying around the place and he was really eager to be out there with his men, but he, he couldn't. And there's uh, St- uh, Sorica talks about in her trips around uh, during 1916 calling in to see him in there in Hardwick Street in the, in the hospital. So when he came out, he found that his name was there for arrest in UCD, that they knew about him. And he uh, talked to Collins, and Collins sent him back to Monaghan to, uh, re- to organise uh, or train the troops in South Monaghan, around the carrick Macross area. A Monaghan man who was caught up in the Easter Rising was Thomas McCain. He came from Monaghan and went to live in Dublin. He was living in Henry Place. 
Now, when the rebels left the GPO, they ran across Henry Street, in which they were being shot at by a British machine gun, and they ran into Henry Place, looking for somewhere safe. The doors were all locked and bolted. But the rebels shot the lock of Thomas McCain's door. He, his wife and nine children were living there at the time. And the bullet ricocheted, it hit Thomas in the shoulder, but unfortunately, it hit young Bridget McCain, who was eight years old, killing her instantly. James Connolly on a stretcher was placed on the McCain's kitchen table. Podrick Pierce was distraught with what happened to the child in the house. Also there were Joseph Plunkett, Sean McGermida, Tom Clark and Michael Collins. Shortly after, they would make their way from here to Moor Street, from where the rebels would surrender. Professor Terence Dooley, lecturer in Maynooth University, is a Monaghan native who has worked with Monaghan Museum in putting together the 1916 exhibition From a Whisper to a Roar. The title itself suggests exactly what happened in Monaghan, that uh, we go from a situation whereby there is very little support or sympathy for the rebels during 1916 and the direct aftermath. But as soon as news begins to filter through to the county of the executions, and in particular the execution of, of James Connolly, who had uh, Monaghan links, then that whisper grows to a roar, as it does throughout most of the, 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 the country. And the quotation is taken from Tom Carrer, an IRA veteran from Dunamine, who tells us that within months of the rise in itself, the sympathy had swung towards Sinn Féin for a variety of different reasons, not just uh, the rise in itself, but conscription and so on. And that by the time of the 1918 general election, Sinn Féin was ready to actually uh, sweep the boards in, in Monaghan um, with two candidates uh, returned for the county. And then by 1920, they'd taken over local government within the county as well. So the rising at the time meant different things to the various different communities within Monaghan. First of all, you had uh, the separatists. Uh, there were only about eight um, who gathered all together uh, to participate in the rising itself within the county, and that they were in Carrick and Cross. But because of the countermanding order, they all returned home on the Sunday morning. So there is no rising in County Manor. The nationalists, um, the old supporters of Home Rule, the Irish Parliamentary Party, um, particularly the, uh, the governing elite, those who monopolised the uh, county council and all the other various local government boards in Monaghan, were highly critical of the rising. The county council uh, passed a resolution condemning the rebels. Carrick Macross, poor law guardian, passed a, a very strong resolution and the chairman is saying that the rebel leaders should be taken out and shot because they were not except revolutionaries and, and, and socialists. So, I mean, that condemnation comes from the vast majority of nationalists within the county itself. They were prepared and they were waiting for home rule, and they would have been very happy with home rule as it had been passed um, in, in, in 1914. Of course, the other community that they have in Monaghan is the Protestant Unionist community. I mean, Monaghan has a 25% Protestant population uh, in 1911. And they very effectively organised an anti-home rule campaign. They uh, participated widely in the Unionist Club movement. About 5,000 Monaghan males signed the Ulster Solemn League and Covenant. And around about 2,000 Monaghan men joined the Ulster Volunteer Force. So, I mean, that community, as would be expected, was very much uh, against the rising as well. But if you take both communities together at the time, the nationalist community and the unionist community. I mean, their focus in many respects was on the front and what was happening uh, during the Great War. By the summer of 1914, there are hundreds of young Monaghan men, Catholic and Protestant, serving at the front. The great push of the 1st of July at the Somme results in the death of scores of, of, of young Monaghan men. So news of that beginning to filter back to the county during the summer of 1916 has at least as much impact on families within the county as, and, as the Ryzen had, in fact more than the Ryzen had the previous Easter. But at the same time, because of the changing attitudes and the sympathy towards the rebels that has grown from Easter onwards, uh, Monaghan becomes a very different place post-1916 to where it was beforehand. Monaghan delivered to the GPO and to the Rising and Stevens Green many 
participants, mm. actually. And one of these was, well, he called himself a Monaghan man, James yeah. Connolly. His parents were from Monaghan, mm. but little more is known about them at now, at, yeah. this, at this point. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, uh, we still know very little about James Connolly's Monaghan background, except that his parents came from around the Annalore district outside Clonus. They left in the second half of the 19th century. They emigrated to, to Edinburgh, where James was born and reared into poverty. He recorded on the census return itself that he was actually born in County Manor, uh, which of course was not the case. So he probably had some form of affinity towards his uh, ancestral roots or his ancestral background. Now, we have evidence uh, that he visited Manhattan in 1898, which suggests that he probably came back for the centenary of the 1798 rebellion. And the local lore has it that an uncle of his had been uh, hanged uh, in 1798. And uh, that may have brought him back then at that particular uh, moment in time. Carrick Macross was one of the mobilising towns for volunteers for the rebellion. Here I met with Francis O'Donoghue, chairman of the South Monaghan 1916 Commemoration Committee. In 1915, volunteers lobbed a brick through the window of O'Neill's Hotel, where the British Army was recruiting. This led to the arrest of three volunteers who were tried at the local courthouse and imprisoned. These prisoners were released in January 1916, and were welcomed back to the town by a large gathering addressed by the O'Rahilly, who himself was later killed in the Rising. O'Rahilly said at that time that it wouldn't be long or there'd be an armed insurrection, which was unusual for him to say. That was, mind you, only weeks before, before the rebellion broke out in, in Dublin anyway. During the time these volunteers were imprisoned, a meeting took place in Carrickmacross at the Catholic Hall, which was packed to the doors to hear from a very passionate speaker. So now, 1915, Podrick Pierce comes and visits here the Catholic Hall. He's taken around in a procession really in the town and when he gets here the hall is packed what's he doing here who's he talking to well it was in the commemor the, the manchester martyrs commemoration but he came to address the volunteers and uh, the volunteers paraded him through the town they escorted him from the railway station round the town and back in here uh, under the horseless procession and they were led by two bands the far local foresters band and the Kalani fife and drum band and he addressed the volunteers here. Uh, the RIC tried to gain entrance to the hall, but the volunteers were armed and to prevent us, anyone coming in to take notes of what he said. And, no. and what he did say fired up the oh, local it, volunteers it fired in this them area. Up. It fired them up, yes, and it was packed to capacity. By people of different uh, um, understandings of what the struggle might be, the local man who commanded Ulster... Uh, uh, division of the Irish Volunteers, uh, Padraig de Burka, who lived here locally, who actually attended that meeting, as did Thomas de Beauvern, who, with Major John McBride, organised an Irish Brigade in South Africa to fight with the Boers against the British Army. Thomas de Boer Byrne was one of the people who attended the Catholic Hall meeting in Carrick Macross and was greatly influenced by the words of Padraig Pierce. He actually went on to have a very important role in the Rising himself. He got the name de Boer from his involvement in the Boer War, where he fought against the British. But later on, after Podrick Pierce had asked him to, Thomas led the Kildare volunteers right down Sackville Street, now O'Connell Street, and into the GPO. And here he fought for the week of the Rising. He was with James Connolly when Connolly was injured, and later on, de Boer escaped from being captured by hiding in a derelict house, eventually making his way out of Dublin and back to Maharukle in County Mana. Later, after the British gave an undertaking of no more executions, he returned to Dublin and became Commandant of the Dublin Brigade, 
and later became the first captain of the guard at Leinster House, appointed by Michael Collins. Thomas married Lucy Smith of Dublin, whom he had met in the GPO as she couriered dispatches and helped the wounded. Thomas and Lucy are the only known couple who both fought in the GPO and who later went on to marry and to have family. Back in Carrick Macross, South Monaghan volunteers were mobilising for the rising. Now, we're coming to a very important building in the story of the South Monaghan volunteers. This was once the Foresters Hall, and on Easter Saturday, volunteers gathered here to take part in the rising. But tell me what happened after that. Yeah, well, the local volunteers gathered here with their arms and uh, equipment to take part in the rising. It seems word came through of McNeil's kind of demanding order that uh, they were to proceed. So they had to disperse, of course. And uh, they decided to meet again the following Sunday in Terry Garvin, which is outside the town. That actually would have been the home of PJ O'Daly, who would have been the commandant of the volunteers. And uh, they met there, but it seems they were under observation at all times by Dorai Sea. So they decided that they, weren't, that they didn't proceed with the rising. And like a lot of other areas throughout the country, but they were demoralised of what they decided not to, not to proceed any further. All right. A report in the Dundalk Democrat later says that there were 16 or 17 arms found in the building in, in uh, New Street. This is O'Neill Street, but it was then known as, as New Street. So obviously the arms were secreted back into the building here and the RIC raided and captured the arms. But there was no further uh, participation by the local volunteers, although some volunteers did get to Dundalk. Whether they participated actually in the raising or not, I can't say. And then the, uh, the volunteers here as well, they couldn't be seen really going into the front of the building. They actually used a, a different way in and a different way out. Yeah. Why was that? Just to, to keep things low key? Yeah, well, of course, it was used also by the brass band, the Foresters Brass Band, the hall here, and it was used by the GAA. Well, constantly under observation by Dora I see, but they could get in through the mineral water factory which was owned by the same person that owned the building, and they could come back out the other way, or indeed they could go back down, back out onto the main street from this way. So, uh, nevertheless, they were constantly under observation, as we know, and, uh, but they didn't get to Dublin, as far as, as far as we can ascertain. None of them actually got as far as the GPO. Two other Monaghan men who were involved in the rising were Bernard McCartan Ward, and James Quigley, who led a company of volunteers into Dublin. Not much is known about James Quigley, but Bernard McCartan Ward is known to have fought in the GPO during Easter week. He was from the Monaghan town area, and his final resting place is in Ladlorcan Cemetery in Monaghan. But this is not where he died. This is the grave of Bernard McCartan Ward. It says here, who fought for Ireland Easter week 1916 and died 8th of May 1917. Bernard McCartan Ward fought in the GPO. He was sent off to prison then later in England, but he never returned home. He died in prison. A letter in the Monaghan County Museum exhibition gives a clue to why people like Bernard McCartan Ward gave themselves to the cause of Irish freedom. I suppose just to tell me about the, the, the letter that we have here, this is Patrick Pierce's letter. Yes, that's right. It's, again, it's another piece that um, Sork would have collected uh, whenever they were clearing out St Dan's School a number of years after the rising. She found this letter and kept it. And it's a letter from Patrick Pierce. He's writing to a gentleman who's asking for information on Robert Emmett's house, where Robert Emmett's house was before he was killed in 1803. And although Pork doesn't know, he talks about the huge influence of Robert Emmett on him. And I think it's fascinating because the letter is dated the 3rd of April 1916. It's written in St. Enda's. And it's three weeks before Pork Pierce walks into the GPO and proclaims a republic. And in it he's talking about one of the men he really seen as a true Irish revolutionary, Robert Emmett, 
who, whenever he was um, being on trial, said that he didn't want to be remembered, he didn't want to be commemorated, until men in the future had the courage to follow through on his principles. And this was one of those men who actually had that courage to follow through. Both Robert M. and Pork Pierce very much were interested in the idea of blood sacrifice, that it was important to sacrifice yourself for the future of your country. And I think this letter really encapsulates that. So because of that, and again obviously you have the signature at the bottom too, and he's such an important part of history, and having that actual physical representation there is fascinating. Katie McGrain from Maher Clun in County Monaghan was working here at the GPO when Padraig Pearce and the rebels stormed the building on Easter Monday. She returned home dodging the bullets and the explosions, but she wrote a letter there to her family back in Monaghan. This letter has in time become a historical document. Katie McGrain's niece, Mary McGrain, told me more of the story of her auntie and the letter that told of the events of the Rising. Uh, my Aunt Katie was born in 1894 and she was the oldest member, living member of the family, my father's family. And she worked as a monitor in the school, Drum Ghost School, until she was 18. Then she got a job in the GPO and on the day the Rising came out there was no bank holiday at that time, on the Monday, and uh, she was a uh, soldier's uh, that she didn't know which soldiers in the GPO told them all to get out. And as they were getting out, uh, they were breaking the windows and putting guns in. So they were escorted out. And uh, the following days after the Rising, on the, on the Tuesday and the Wednesday, she would have won, got out to look around. And uh, she has very graphic des uh, descriptions of uh, Sackville Street, as it was then known. Uh, horses. What struck me was the number of horses as well as people that were killed. Uh, there were people killed just opening their front door. There were people killed walking along the street. So the British, uh, the, the government then uh, set up a curfew and people were not allowed outside their houses till uh, after 7.30 in the evening. This letter that she had written, just explaining what was happening at the time to yes. her and in her surroundings, yes. has since become a very historical document. Yes, uh, whereas my Auntie Katie had no uh, direct involvement in the Rising, she was a, a spectator. And her letter is very, very graphic and is in itself now a piece of history. We kept it as a family heirloom but it is now a piece of history as it has been done here in the museum. And we'd have to compliment the museum on the wonderful way they used her photograph and her letter. So um, I was thinking at the exhibition that what would my Aunt Katie say if she saw herself in there and the letter? She would probably be very embarrassed because I said she wouldn't have wanted that big of a big show. But anyway, that's, that's, as I said, she was nearly retired when I first knew her. So she lived to be 84, I think. And uh, She was a witness to one of the most important events. In the history of this country. Yeah. But she didn't know. She didn't know that she was... Uh, she would never have thought that she was important enough that this would be done for her and her letter. There was an awful lot of ordinary people killed some said Moor Street and St Stephen's Green were full of dead bodies lying around. It was hard to get bread. One day we were out and we saw one man lying shot dead on the street and a bag thrown over him. Someone else said they saw a man and a woman and a sheep thrown over them. I believe the streets around the pillar were full of shot people and in some places they were nearly a week lying without being buried. Today and yesterday there are crowds of funerals and two or three coffins in each hearse. It was a great wonder to see a hearse with only one coffin. We saw a woman dead yesterday shot too. There were crowds of men and women and children shot. Some were shot in their own homes, closing the windows. Uh, there was a nun shot in William Street. She was closing her window. Uh, there, the, uh, the Matter Hospital at that point were dressing the wounds of those who had been injured. The city is in martial law now for a month and all of us have to be in the house by 7.30. So that's a, a kind of a flavour of, of what 
she saw as she went round. And when she looked at the GPO, that was her place of work. And they didn't know what was going to happen to them. They, they could see the sky when they went in around the GPO. The whole building had been destroyed. So uh, it was a very frightening time for them. And even if they went out to look, bread is apparently, there was no fresh stuff coming in. So uh, they'd have to ask the soldier if they could go by. And if the place was dangerous, he would tell them, no, they can't go there. So it, it's, it's a very, very graphic letter. And uh, it's kind of eerie. To, to think that that's what my aunt saw and wrote it down. It's, there's an eeriness about that for me because uh, she was such a quiet little woman, lovely little woman. Another Monaghan man served his time in the GPO, fighting with the volunteers. William Darcy was from here, Ardahi, County Monaghan. He was a cabinet maker by trade, but he was also a Hibernian rifleman. He spent all of Easter week stationed on the first floor of the GPO, and after the rising, he was imprisoned for a period of time. William Darcy died just two years later. He was working here at our dying church when he suffered a heart attack. Another Monaghan eyewitness to the rising was Charles Laverty, a prominent Castle Blaney solicitor. On Easter week, he and his wife and four children were all confined to the Gresham Hotel during the rebellion. On Easter Monday, as they headed to the National Museum in Kildare Street, Laverty said that the city gave no clue to the terrible events that were to begin that day. But by Tuesday, the streets were filled with looters carrying away all sorts of expensive goods. On Thursday, during a lull in the fighting, he witnessed something he claimed would stay with him for the rest of his life. A bare-legged, barefooted boy of six or seven years of age joyfully kicking a new football around Nelson's pillar. He shivered with fear for the unfortunate child who played on, absolutely heedless of the danger, but who then walked away unscathed. On Saturday, the entire city centre was, he said, red with a lurid flame from the blazing buildings. A column of men in volunteer uniforms made their way from the direction of Nelson's pillar. Pierce had surrendered. Louise Gavin Duffy was the daughter of Charles Gavin Duffy, the prominent Monaghan man. She only found out about the rising on Easter Monday and made her way directly to the GPO to tell Porrick Pierce that she did not agree with the course of action that he had taken. Nevertheless, she stayed in the GPO for the entire week, running the kitchens on the top floor, and she went on to become an influential member of Common Nabon. Annie Higgins was born in Dublin but was working as a music teacher in Carrickmacross in 1916. During Easter week, she cooked for the volunteers in the Hibernian Bank opposite the GPO. She was sent with dispatches to Monaghan, but was arrested en route and spent time in prison with Constance Markovich. One of the most famous women of the Rising was Margaret Skinner, who was born to Irish parents who lived in Scotland. But her father was from Tydavnet in County Monaghan. She was a mathematics teacher and joined Countess Markovich's Common Nabon in Glasgow. She was an excellent markswoman, having learned to shoot in a rifle club. And these are skills she would have used fully in the Rising. Margaret Skinner smuggled ammunitions into Ireland in preparation for the planned Easter Rising. She arrived in Dublin a week before the rebellion and lodged with Markovich. When the Rising broke out, on Easter Monday, Skinner took up a position on St. Stephen's Green, under the command of Major Michael Mallon and Countess Markovitz, and was active running dispatches and moving munitions until they had to retreat from the Green to a more secure location. This is the Royal College of Surgeons. The rebels retreated from Stephen's Green here to the college here, and it was here on the roof that Margaret Skinner was a sniper woman. From the roof space of the College of Surgeons, Margaret Skinner said, It was dark there, full of smoke and the din of firing, but it was good to be in action. More than once, I saw the man I aimed at fall. On the Wednesday of the Rising, she was shot three times when attempting to burn down houses in Hardcourt Street. It was not her injuries 
But my disappointment at not being able to bomb the Shelburne Hotel was what made me unhappy. I'm meeting with Patsy Brady of the North Monaghan-based Margaret Skinner Appreciation Society to find out a little of the research work they are doing into her ancestry and the story of her life. So her father came from from here. Her father is was born and baptized in the parish of Tidavid on the on the 31st of December 1846. And the home place that he was born and raised in, the ruins are still there. Yes, the ruins of his mother, Margaret's grandmother. Ancestral so, home ruins are where we're going to visit today. So we're going today to visit the ancestral homestead of Margaret Skinner. But she actually came here herself, although she was born in Scotland. She came to Monaghan. And what kind of experience did she have in Monaghan? Well, as she said in, in her own book, doing a bit for Ireland, uh, she came regularly to her ancestral home in Cornegilke, parish of Tidavid in Monaghan, uh, as a young girl with with her parents, obviously, and her brothers and sisters. And while there, they would have spent maybe up to tr- three months. She says again herself in the book where she uh, it, uh, disembarked from the train in the GNR station in, on the North Road in Monaghan. Uh, it was the first place she would have set, set foot on her soil of her ancestors in County Monaghan. And uh, from there, she was picked up uh, by a neighbour in a pony and jaunting car and uh, as a family they would have travelled out the road uh, approximately six, six, na- six to seven miles out the road uh, to, to their ancestral home and on the way out she would have passed uh, at least up to five uh, what would be classed as uh, uh, the big houses or planters homes on, on the way out and then as she came within say two kilometres of her own little thatched roadside cottage in Cornelta uh, the, the landscape changed completely because she's now quite close to the foothills of the Slave Bay mountain area where farms are much smaller and uh, houses are of a much poorer standard. As she said in her book herself, she says, uh, Scotland is my home but Ireland is my country. She was very proud of her, of her Irish uh, links. We're actually here right in the original part of the homestead. This is, this is where Margaret Skinner came to as a child, maybe a 12 year old, and this is where her grandmother lived, part of the, the buyer, the house, all of that's together. Yes. Clay floors, this is the kind of experience she would have had. Exactly, this is this one. And, uh, this is where she probably found peace, tranquility, and uh, a complete contrast in life to what she would have been uh, having, living in her native Because Oakbridge. she came from a very industrial type town. Now she's come all the way to Ireland. She's passed some of the bigger houses, big, bigger estates. Now she's come to some of the smaller homesteads and uh, a little stone cottage like this with the clay floors. These things influenced her greatly in her thinking and her, you know, her love of Ireland. Of course there would have been. And you can just imagine what was going through the mind of a young girl like her as she, as she played in the fields uh, on, on those summer days. And she, uh, look, looking out in the southerly direction, she was looking out at the at the, the nearest uh, estate, which was the, the estate of Gertrude Rose of Montmore, who incidentally was born in Scotland as well, yet was the owner of 21 townlands in the area. And uh, while uh, out on from the back, she, uh, Margaret was looking out onto the, the, the poor and small homes of the Save Bay Mountain region. After the surrender, Margaret Skinner was active during the War of Independence and was arrested and imprisoned. During the Civil War, she became Paymaster General of the Provisional Irish Republican Army. Later, she worked as a teacher in Dublin until her retirement and was a prominent member of the Irish National School Teachers Association for many years. 100 years ago, a seminal event in Irish history took place. There are many Monaghan connections to the Easter Rising. People who were witnesses to the events that happened there people whose heritage came from the county, people who were directly involved in the Rising. Some of these stories are only now being told for the first time, and there's lots more to be found out about the history of many of these people. So perhaps now, 100 years later, is a good time to examine these stories more fully and tell them more completely.
Oh, oh, oh. 